and, the two, and two of the second stage entries. Um, he was also the engineer of the winning schemes of both competitions, which we were in the second stage for. And I think it's fair to say that most um, competitions are won by schemes with Tony Paul. Very many are won with schemes. <laughs> So if you want to win a That's my competition, you, uh, increase, increase your chance by uh, yeah. 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 Yes, <laughs> yeah. Um, but he has also uh, been the engineer of um, some of the, what I would consider as the world class buildings that have been built in this country during the last 10 or 15 years. Um, and I think he has made a major con contribution to the fact that I think probably England is leading the world in architecture at this moment. And Tony Hunt has made a major contribution to the buildings um, which those are concerned with. Uh, John Parrish <coughs> has very kindly agreed to act as chairman. And I'll let Tony get on with his talk. Well, thank you, Robin. I think that's one of the nicest things anybody ever said about me. It's um, very flattering. Um, I need to stay sitting down for a minute, I think, after that. Uh, it was very difficult. Um, I wasn't asked a particularly short notice to give this talk, so I can't really claim that as an excuse. But it was very difficult to know what to put together and what to talk about. I mean, I, it was indicated what people would like me to talk about, and that was fine. Um, but how to actually put some work together it was very difficult. Um, not because we're such great engineers, but because in fact we have been very fortunate in working with a lot of architects on a lot of very fine schemes. And I have made the mistake in the past of trying to show too much and perhaps too little detail to people. <coughs> and I think that's so sometimes that's failed. Um, and so this evening I've gone the other way and I'm, I've called the talk attention to detail. And I'm only actually going to talk about two buildings, two structures. Um, at the risk of upsetting some people perhaps, I mean I don't think I will, I mean but you have to it's a terrible tightrope, actually, being a structural engineer in some ways, because you work with a lot of architects. Uh, a lot of his work I admire very much, and I enjoy working with them, but it's sometimes very different. And I'm quite glad to see that there aren't certain people in this room, <laughs> because I might be upsetting them. Uh, but you can't, you know, you sort of can't, can't win all the time. I'm going to talk just about two steel frame buildings with which we, I and we as an office have been, were very, very closely involved. Sainsbury Centre, which is Foster Associates, and the Inmos Microelectronics Factory, which is nearly complete, which is, which is Richard Rogers Partners Limited now. Um, really, in terms of structures, they're, in, in terms of structural principle, they're both quite simple, they're very different, as you no doubt know, and you will certainly see from slides. Um, and in essence, they're both linear, repetitive structures. They just sort of go on and on and on, and you could actually reproduce them ad infinitum with sort of expansion joints and things every so often, and it would be rather nice if somebody commissioned us to do that in the future. Um, the Sainsbury Centre is really just um, I mean, they're both steel frame. Sainsbury Centre is what I call a modified portal building. It's modified in the sense that instead of doing the traditional portal thing where you have a stiff corner joint between the beam and the two columns, um, that joint is actually free. And we, we got, we achieved the stiffness actually by fixing the base of the columns. Um, and the reason for that was so that we could achieve the sort of corner joint that we wanted rather than having to sort of beef it up in some way 
which otherwise we would have had to have done and made it, I think, less elegant. And because of the foundation system we ended up with on that site, it was easy to do that. So we had these um, two lattice towers, as it were, prismatic towers. I'm talking about one slice of the building now, and a simple lattice girder that spans between them, um, with a pin joint one end and a sliding joint the other. And that's all it is, the Sainsbury Centre, really. It's a number, it's 37 of those things marching down the side. I never remember if it's 36 or 37, I think it's 37. Um, spaced equally, spaced apart, linked together, wind braced at the ends. Um, Inmos is quite different. Um, it is much bigger in terms of its width, but only actually about the same length now, since it uh, was originally designed to be a much bigger building. Um, and then because of its various sort of political vagaries, it got chopped down in size and its function changed slightly. Um, but it is a quite different animal in that, I mean, A, the, the same percent of the structure is totally clad apart from the ends of the building. Um, in Moss Centre, in, in Moss, is the, the structure is totally unclad, as it were, and the cladding is slung underneath the structure. Um, and it's, I'd, to describe it as a structure, I suppose you'd say it was a, it's a, well, I describe it as a tension-assisted wing structure. I mean, it's rather difficult to describe it in words. Perhaps we ought to start looking at the slides in a minute. Um, the one thing about, particular thing, well, there are several particular things about the inmost structure. One of them is that um, it is a totally pin-jointed structure. And by that, I mean they are real pins. They are single stainless steel pins that link all the joints together. Um, held captive by split pins and special washers and things like that, which I can show you in a minute. Um, and therefore it relies on certain types of bracing to stop it falling down. Um, and really, I suppose the only similarity between the two structures is that they're built in... some slides up now and talk about um, a bit about the development of the structures that went on um, between ourselves and all the other, and the architects and all the other <coughs> consultants. Um, to talk a little bit more about structural principles. I want to talk about some of the problems we've had and some of the problems we thought we were going to have and didn't have. Um, and some of the ones we did have that we didn't anticipate in one or two cases, one case in particular. So if I could start, we'll put the slides up. Um, <coughs> Somebody's pinched my ashtray. Is that a, is that a hint? That's <laughs> right, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> well, I mustn't have too much, I'll get an absolute slosh before I'm halfway through. Um, what, with the wine or the ashtray? Mm. Or being sloshed off? No, I don't like the other one. Um, to start with the Sainsbury Centre, well, something that maybe some people haven't seen, I don't suppose most of the people have seen the side on the left anyway. Um, Sainsbury Centre had a rather long and rather uh, checkered design history, as I think Richard will probably bear, bear me out on that maybe one or two other people. Um, <coughs> we, I set out as an engineer with no brief at all on the building. I mean, so little brief that we didn't even know. Nobody knew actually where the building was going to go on the site. Um, there was a brief in the sense that we knew what the accommodation brief was. Um, but there was no inkling for quite a long time, actually, as to what sort of building it was going to be in any terms at all. And actually for an engineer that's rather difficult because you've got to have some sort of fix. You need something to sort of latch onto. 
to be, begin to be able to think about designing some sort of structure, even if it turns out to be completely crazy or completely different in the end. But we got to the point where we were exploring the idea of, I mean, this is quite a long way down the line, actually, but um, exploring the idea of a big shed, a double height shed, and we had two options around this. This is one of the design sketches, <coughs> one of a number which I produced for the model that's there, which actually got an awful long way. I mean, we had budget tenders back for this, <coughs> and we all appeared to be quite happy with it at one time. There were alternatives for the cladding inside or outside. What was that? <laughs> was that you, Michael? <laughs> <laughs> oh, was it? Oh, God, all these people who were in the office at the time. Yes, that's right. What? <laughs> Well, we were happy about it at one time, and well, we wouldn't have had the damn thing out of tender. Um, it was Georgia, actually. Oh, was it? Yes, well. <laughs> um, but I remember very clearly that uh, going in, we had regular meeting every week, a design team meeting, and went on for a long while. And I remember going in one morning, there was a sort of slightly bleak atmosphere in Foster's office. Norman looked particularly sort of thin-lipped, and I thought, oh dear, uh, something's up. And he came and joined, we were all sitting around the big table, he came and joined the meeting, and he said, I think there's something I ought to say immediately, and that is that I'm actually not happy with the building as it is. Um, I, you know, it's wrong in some way, and just, just that. And I said, well, if, you know, if you're unhappy, if it's wrong, if you think it's wrong, despite you know, having got so far down the line, we'll stop and think and do something else. Start again, maybe. And that's actually just what we did. We started again. Sit right hand buttons, please. And the first, which is not true, because we had an intermediate period where we actually we explored a triadetic aluminium structure for this building. And there were a lot of, we were a bit short of time then on the program and a lot of problems because the triadetic thing was all developed in Canada. And it went to, it. Well, I mean, we went and spent some time in Canada <coughs> with the people who developed it there. But I think perhaps around that thing that we lost our nerve and opted in the end for doing the building that you now see that is actually built and that was the sort of rough first rough design sketch for it um, it isn't incidentally a space frame and it never was although it was written on that drawing there um, because a space frame doesn't really work very well on what's primarily basically a linear building um, but I think you can see a sort of certain similarity between those the services don't work the same way either because you haven't got those service ducts underneath or those caissons or whatever they're called um, it actually is serviced from the two wall zones within the structure. But that slide on the right really shows the essence of the whole structure, as far as, you know, that, that is it, really. But I'd like to take you through a few things and, and describe a little bit about it. Yes, well... Um, <coughs> the previous slide that shows the overall thing and this joint which, incidentally, these drawings were done before it was constructed, not after. <laughs> um, some time before. That was an idea around how one might solve that connection, which is the major connection between the lattice girder and the column. Um, and the reason it's offset like that, which is an engineering nightmare, actually, because really, of course, ideally, that ought to be over here, as I think everybody would realize. But the fact that because of certain geometric things that are going on, both there and here, um, and the separation between the two, and the curve around the corner, uh, which was crucial, and I remember very clearly one New Year's Day, lying on the floor in Norman's place with Norman and Tony Pritchard, who helped to develop the cladding and glazing system for this, and me, drawing this whole thing up full size to find out how one could actually make it work. And it became increasingly obvious that the only way you could actually make it work was by offsetting that vertical support. Um, and that's what we opted to do in the end. And, I mean, it, as I say, it gave us some problems structurally because you can see that long welded joint, which runs down there, which I very cleverly haven't drawn in on this thing. 
but there's a long weld down there. And it got to the point where, although we calculated, we actually had to test it. We had a full-size proper bit made and tested it. And to prove to ourselves that it actually worked OK, which it did. <coughs> and um, so that's the sort of thing that developed from this sort of drawing. Um, not very elegant, actually, I don't think, that joint on the right. Uh, the actual, can you can't see it except at you the ends aware, of the building. No. no, you're not, but there's one or two things around this joint that I'm actually unhappy with. I mean, it works fine structurally, but it doesn't look very nice. And that annoys me, although you have to go up in the roof to see it. Um, <coughs> and it's a lesson to me to not, well, it's unfortunate, but you, you don't, if you're, you know, you, sometimes you can't let anything get out of your own hands. If you do, it sort of gets mucked up, <laughs> which is a pity because I don't think it would happen again in my office, actually. I think people are sensitive enough now and aware enough to know that if I found out about that, there'd be hell to pay, and it would actually never ought to be like that. Um, just some general construction sites which people may or may not have seen. I mean, it is a big shed, double height, into which are slotted two mezzanines, which are entirely separately supported. Um, and those mezzanine structures are steel, but then they're fire clad. And then the fire cladding is then clad in stainless steel, precast concrete floors. Um, so they don't touch the main structure, don't have anything to do with it at all. And that's just showing the beginnings of the sort of <coughs> all, the, all the stuff that's going in within the wall zone structure itself. Yes, two construction shots looking across the width of the building, which I think show, you, know, you can see quite clearly the prismatic girders. Um, the aluminium subframe system which is going in to support the cladding. There's an interesting story about that in that that sub-assembly, which sits on top of the structure, both for the walls and the roof, had 3,600 landing plates, landing fixing points. And out of those 3,600, only two were out of tolerance. It was plus or minus three mil. And, um, I mean, we were rather pleased about that. Fosters were pretty delighted, and tube workers who fabricated the stuff were pretty pretty pleased as well. And of course, as a result of doing that, they've set themselves a standard uh, that they have to meet every time we use them now. So they just keep them up to it. <coughs> I'd like to talk for a minute, actually, about the, the structural principles behind the frame of this building, because although it's this simple pair of legs and the beam that's, that spans across the top, we did have some <coughs> particular problems at the ends where the glazing, which is full height, with glass mullions, actually comes into the bottom boom of the trusses, which means that it puts in a horizontal force in on the bottom boom, and which meant that we had to make the last two trusses on each end of the building, the last two which are in parallel to one another, into a stiff girder in some way, uh, both the trusses and the columns. And what we did was we used a form of scissor bracing, both in, in the bottom plane and the top plane, to form the whole thing into a rigid, uh, stiff element to take horizontal load. And <coughs> the, there's another sort of slight sadness for me here, although nobody else ever comments on it, and that is that it is only at the ends of the building that you get that joint. I and mean, I'm talking very much against myself here, and against ourselves. You, that doesn't occur anywhere else except at the end of the building. And that joint is designed solely to take horizontal load from that thing into here. Now, it looks very much as though it's designed to take vertical load, and it isn't. And if it takes vertical load, that joint actually fails. Um, and I do feel that we should have made that joint look so different that it, because it was doing a different job. I mean, apart from that, I think the whole structure is fine and it's really worked out rather well. But uh, there you are. These two shots looking through the roof, down the length of the building, 
it's sort of showing the consistency of the whole thing and across the width of the building with the catwalks that run down each prismatic truss. I mean, these trusses are 2.4 metres deep <coughs> and you walk through them. <coughs> Tony, is it your camera? But they all seem to be inflecting so well, Who slides these, Tony? The other one, the earlier one, is too. I think the screen's bent. Are they looking funny? They're pet slides, all of them. Mm, all of them. I don't, I don't, I only take pictures as an amateur. I leave Pat to take the real pictures. Um, <coughs> yes, she's taken all these and all, all those the... Construct, those constructors... Uh, she did all the construction ones as well. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. No, well, nobody ever asks her what slides she takes, takes except me, you see, you know. Um, She's got very good depth of field, hasn't she? <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 yes, why, yes, yeah. Throw you that. See you later. Um, I don't think there's anything more to have said about that. Those two. All that. Um, I mean, I think really this is preaching to the converted, to show, talking around these slides, but, um, you know, you come in across this pedestrian bridge, which is quite a nice little piece of structure in itself. That's a series of RHS um, sections uh, with transverse RHS members as well, which make it into a sort of stiff box, which is supported off these single pipe columns. It goes straight into the building and through as the same form, and you end, so you end up in there. And um, then you come down this... I hope that's it. Yes, you come down this staircase which is a single tube with this awful eccentric load from the bridge coming onto it, of course. <coughs> and a folded sheet steel tread and riser thing with a, with a, a, a warped um, stringer which is welded around the outside of those treads and risers and onto which is clamped a steel plate with socket head set screws. And it's that outer steel plate that actually holds the acrylic um, balustrade sheet on and it all works very precisely but there's a lovely story about this staircase because um, and I'm sure lots of other people have come across the same situation there are certain bits of a building which you you think that you can leave until a later, later date you don't sort of bother to design them in detail and this happened about this staircase and there was a time when we were going to have a ramp there was a time when this staircase actually went down through a hole in the floor into the basement and that hole had to be subsequently filled up because it, for security reasons but it got to the point where we finally agreed that we were going to have this staircase we designed it but all the building was clad and it really wouldn't have mattered if it had been or not because this staircase actually doesn't fit between the bits of structure even when it's unclad and was not only clad with the aluminium uh, vacuum form panels but all the end glazing was in by that time and it was touch and go whether we could get the staircase in at all without taking the glazing out and it was really thanks to the work man works manager of two workers who went up and did a sort of cunning survey one day mm. who said well I think if we're very careful and we make the staircase up complete and we lie it <coughs> on its side and put it on a cradle what was that? You screw it. Right? That's right, you screw, you screw it in, and that's just what they did. That's what screws do. That's it. But they were so, so unsure of themselves that they took it up very, very early one morning before anybody got there, just in case it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> and they got it in, and when we got there, it was all up. And they were sort of rubbing their hands, but my God, it was a near thing. Um, Picture the screw was right. That's right, well, he calculated it right. They've still got the cradle on which it was transported, actually, and screwed in up a tube work, because they keep it as a sort of souvenir. Um, we had terrible problems actually with this staircase because it swayed and um, I mean it would sway if it's got an eccentric load on its on, on one sort of side of it at the top, you know. Um, but it swayed in not, not quite the way that we really wanted to wanted it to and we had to actually make some mods to it at a later date, which was all a bit of an embarrassment. Um, but just to say that engineers, well maybe some engineers are perfect, I don't know. Um, we have problems with some of our structures uh, and we have to find ways of solving them. <coughs> well, the study reserve area here with the offices uh, which, which are underneath one of the mezzanines um, and a view looking down on them again. 
um, just really general shots of the of, of the building. What have we got? And the restaurant, the far end. With this is this is an, uh, um, the other side of the mezzanine. With the restaurant and the view looking out over the park. Um, that's the door. Well, I don't think it was that one. I think it was a, there's a matching one on the opposite end. But that's the door through which the staircase was screwed. It doesn't look possible actually to me, but it did work. Mm. And that really, I think, tells you all about it, day and night. That's a special exhibition end, with the sun blinds down because they, 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 they shut automatically when the, the sun comes out. And this is through the restaurant end at night. Um, looking like something out of Close Encounters, I reckon. Just to talk for a few minutes about uh, the structure itself, before I go on to, I think these are the last two slides of this one. Um, it's all made out of normal grade, mild steel. All the bits are welded up in the workshop in major elements. The columns are welded in one, one length each and transported to site. The main trusses, it's very foreshortened, that one on the left, actually. The main trusses, which are 35 meters long, side to side, were actually made up in two halves because they couldn't transport that length in one go, and they were, they were welded on site when they, when they were up in position, and then the welds ground flush. <coughs> um, the welds were radiographically tested. I don't think we had a single weld rejection on the whole job which I don't think is particular thanks to us. I think, I think it's thanks to the fabricators who are exceedingly good. Um, and I think I'm right in saying that we had actually hardly any problems with the superstructure of this building. And we didn't have many of the substructure either. This had building has a basement down the center of it. Um, but it really went, I mean, Michael, <coughs> Can you think of any? I mean, we didn't really have any hiccups, I don't think, did we, with the, with the structure? I mean, I don't think we had many hiccups with the cladding either. I mean, the building really, once we got the thing finally designed and we knew exactly what we were doing, we did the production information and it actually got built. We did have a very good contractor, a pair of contractors. Um, it just went like clockwork, which I think buildings should do. Actually, I mean, I think if you get yourself organised properly, buildings shouldn't be a problem on site. And I don't think there's very much, you know, much more I can say about it. If you want to ask any any questions afterwards, well, yes, fine. I think I'm going to be encouraged to answer them, aren't I? <laughs> now, this is the Inmos project. Um, which, as I say, is quite different structurally, but it's also quite different in other ways. I mean, we didn't have much time to design this building. In the end, it turns out we had more time than we bargained for because we had a six-month break in the program. But we didn't know that when we started, so we couldn't take advantage of it. Um, and just a comparison here between the built structure. I have some, there are some later slides coming up, by the way, which show it fairly up to date but that's the structure itself, end on. Um, and some rough design sketches about around how one might approach the ways of bracing the tower and ways of doing the tower generally. The principle of this structure is there are a series of what we call towers at 13.4 meter centers marching down the site. And those towers have three levels. Well, they have two and a, two and a top one, as it were, level one, level two, and then the top. Um, and it's at level one that the main structural roof girders come in. And from the central, the tower's 4.8 meters wide, and from the central tower, those girders go out 38 meters either side. And they're tension hanger supported. They're not cables, they're high tensile steel rods. They're actually McAlloy bars. Um, what you use for a particular type of post-tensioning process. 
in reinforced concrete. Um, so they're, they're <coughs> their tension rod supported at roughly third points. Can you get them there? No, they're joined. They have screw connectors. No, you can't. No, they. Uh, you can see the joints. They're actually straight, sort of. They're not bottle screws. They're and they're not. Uh, yes, they're. So they're not welded up. They're screwed. No, they're screwed up because it's because you don't want to weld them because actually it affects the properties of steel. But they are actually they're rolled threads, not turned threads, which means that you don't reduce the diameter of the rod by using a die to cut the thread <coughs> but you roll them and it, it actually it's a it's a sort of forcing out process fattened out rather than cutting away process yeah um, and you can see on the outer hangers that there are two sets of connectors um, which have no adjustment in them they're done up dead tight you know they go fully home because we have adjustment actually at the, at the bottom only at the only at the bottom, and I think you'll be able to see that probably in one of the other slides. Um, but you can see you've got this central spine thing with, a, with wings that stick out either side, um, with a, a spine of foundations that runs down as well. We had a hell's own job with the foundations on this site because, um, I mean, it would have been fine if it hadn't been for Margaret Thatcher's decision to move the site from Bristol to Newport, because the site of Bristol actually was fabulous, very good ground, marvellous site visually. <laughs> Much nearer where Inmos wanted it. Is that right, Mike? Yes. That's I right. mean, it's where they wanted it. Um, and we, they, we in the end got this crummy site. <coughs> and we had to spend a lot of time and a lot of money improving the ground with a special process um, to ensure that we could found the building. Anyway, that aside, we, I mean, it's all worked out very successfully and we're on program and the thing's being completed at the end of this month. I'm going to talk about some of the joints for a bit and then go and talk about the building generally. Um, because I'm supposed to be talking about uh, These are some of the, what I call, second stage design sketches that we did in the office. In the, we did a whole series of very rough ones, which indicated what we thought we wanted. And then we want, uh, went on to set the grids up accurately and the tube member sizes accurately, so that we knew that we weren't fooling ourselves anymore because it's very easy to do that. You draw lovely drawings and then you find that you've actually got the tube or whatever size is wrong and you can't make the joints work when you can't do it properly. So we set them up properly as a series of diagrams and all the joints were done on this basis like this. Um, and I mean that isn't quite like the diagrams mm -hmm. there. Um, and it's not too dissimilar to the top one. That is actually the inboard end of the main girder where it joins into the one of the main columns and there you can see a stainless steel pin, stainless steel split pin, stainless steel washer, which is backed by a PTFE washer. Um, and that is the only place, actually, where we have two pins rather than one. But those two pins are on <coughs> axis with all the members, and therefore you don't get a bending set up in that joint, although you might think so. I was going to ask, I didn't have two pins. Ah, well, there was great heart searching about that joint, actually, Michael. Great heart searching. Um, but it, it does actually work as a pin joint. You go on to the... Yeah, I'm sorry about the blinding light from that one. Um, this is one of very early design sketches. Uh, quite a lot of ideas incorporated there, but the top ones were talking about the drawing way, ways in which one might make the top connection between all the tension hangers on the top of the tower, top of the mast, whatever you call it, and actually it's come out fairly similar in the end to what we actually talked about in the first place. Um, and that's what happens up at the top. The thing down below on the right-hand slide is actually looking up through the twin top tubes of the main girder, which are spaced apart with a, with a tubular batten, and then the, the latticing between the top and the bottom booms is actually only one layer deep as it were zigzagging along and comes into the center of that that brace between the two tubes so the top of the girder is in fact a virandil horizontally which takes a certain amount of lateral loading um, and from which those other those those v things spring cool. i was going to ask you 
Austria, there's a lovely place at the end of the road. So, are those casting? Mm. Do you want me to go back? Yes, they are. I mean, the, uh, yes, perhaps I should point out which are casting. Originally, we, just, we thought we hadn't got time or maybe money to do casting, <coughs> and then it transpired that we, we could. We designed them all as fabricated bits in the first place, and then I think maybe thanks somewhat to Mike Davis, who said, you know, castings, come on, castings, to go for. And we have quite a lot of castings, which have been very successful. We have male and female castings. Yeah. Um, on the job, and I think you can see immediately the ones that are, you know, on that. You mean they cast as part of the, of the rod? No, they're not. No, the rods. No, the rods are separate and so plain, and the castings are well. No, the castings are welded onto the rods. They're pre-prepared with beveled ends, and they're um, the submerged, welding, aren't welded. Doesn't the welding um, affect the, the sort of mix of the steel? Yeah. Marginally, but not particularly. I mean, going back on what I said earlier, that yes. we wouldn't have... Yes, that's right. <laughs> Caught me out there. Yes. Short memory, yes. Well, engineers have short memories, actually. Yes, yes, yes. But in yes. fact, I, I must say, it's, it's a beautiful joint, actually. It is a nice joint. I, I, I'm impressed how you can weld um, a, 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 a cast splay on, 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 onto the rod. Um, what I don't quite understand from that photograph is whether the... Um, the planes, there are two planes in which these um, two triangles are, uh, are shown. Um, are they totally independent of each other? Yes. Two vertical members? Or is there a join between the two vertical members that you can't see? Well, like, I, think, I think I know what you're talking about. I, I need a pointer, I haven't got one. But... Are you saying, are you talking about those two? Right, yes, yes. yes. Well, I did explain. On, on, on a big spine. Twin, twin vertical tubes there, yes. that's one yes. half of the spine. Yes. Those are actually, have a zigzag tubular lacing between oh. them, which you can just yes. see there, oh. which you'll see more clearly in a minute. Oh. So, and it's very confusing, this, because it's taken with a very long focus lens. Yes. And that and that are identical. Yes. That plate and that plate are identical. That matches that. So you've got a twin system going. Right, yes. Right? And that and that matches that. Those are the outer twin tension members. Those are the inner quadruple ones. And then you have the, the, the pairs which are running across the center, which link the two yes. masts together, as it were. And this is one coming towards you. The castings are triangles. That is a ca that, those are castings there. But you all those. Those the end, and that is a casting, that fork end. <coughs> Which are welded onto the end of the rods, yes, that's right. <coughs> Tony, since we're talking about that, Peter, why are there two rather than just one in the lower uh, system? Is that just to keep the diameters of the tubes of the, of the rods constant? Mm, mm. I mean, that's. Yes. Was there one said an aesthetic decision there? No, it wasn't an aesthetic decision at all. It was a, we had at one time, and when we were drawing it. What? <laughs> it's not reliance for trials. The, <laughs> you know, the diagonal bracing that you can take out. Except that I'm waiting with the day that the client takes the wrong diagonal bracing out and the building will actually fall down. And it'll Why serve him bloody well right. One? Sorry. Why have two instead of just one? Because what we were trying to do was to get the diameters of the rods all the same. And the forces are different in the different ones. Mm. Does that explain? <coughs> You're going to be thoroughly difficult, aren't you, Michael? No, no, I'll leave it to later. Go on. No. Actually, I'll talk to you about it later because there is a funny thing about that. Um, we'll be here for hours. What do you do about maintenance of the rods? I suppose they have to be painted. Yes, we have a very high paint specification. Um, I think I'm right in saying we have a guarantee. <laughs> ten years? We hoped it would be fifteen, but it's ten years. We have a ten years warranty on it. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a relatively expensive and very high quality finish but it's actually not terribly sophisticated in the sense that it's not one of these clever two-part epoxy things which is Hell's job to replace when it finally deteriorates. In fact, the top coat on that is chlorinated rubber, which over a period of time deteriorates in such a way that what it really does, does is it just mats down and it gives you, f when it comes to be repainted, the surface on just the surface you need on which to repaint. It have to be cleaned down 
but no other surface preparation. You just paint another top coat on top of it. It is true to say that you've got to paint it from time again. Of course, it's not it's not permanent, you know. Um, I mean, we couldn't afford stainless steel. Very nice um, Thank you. Well, I mean, I take some credit for the details, but I think that Mike Davis also, who pushed fairly hard, should take some credit for the details as well. And um, well, I know. Well, yeah, but how you do it? You do. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I'll tell you exactly how you do it. Actually. It's like it is anyway, at the general scale. Yes, we'll talk but about that. that but, but it actually, the details are stunningly good, I think. <coughs> Do you want me to talk about that now or later? Well, no, I'll talk about it later. I'll talk, I'll, talk, well, I'll talk about it later you this mean, evening, I mean. Elsewhere, don't you? Well, I just think they're very good, yes. I mean, I agree. Well, I think there are, I think there are a number of reasons why they... I mean, I, I think they're good as well, and I think that um, Roger's office think they're good as well. There are a number of reasons, um, and it's not all necessarily to do with either me or Roger's office, it's to do with some other things as well, which perhaps we could talk about. But let's just go on through through this. Yeah, there's a shot of the... That's, Christopher, that's the tower, yeah. one of the towers. You can now see the... Perhaps I should have put that in earlier. The twin tubes of, of each of the columns yes. laced together. Oh, we had that lacing in and out and in and out. It was laced and then it was battened and then it was laced and then it was battened and... Um, but that's, that's what it ended up like, and there's a general view of it under construction. You can see the sort of progression of things happening there. Um, starting off with a simple tower sticking up in the air, there were three of those, and then they began to be linked together with the beams at level one. The cranes are nice, yes, 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 we didn't design those. Uh, they do, crane manufacturers, crane designers do it better than we do, I think, even. Well, the cranes might be nice, but they're not so nice to build it. Oh, well, um, right. Tell, well, what's that connection between the two booms? Is it about sort of 600 mils? Uh, no, these, these two booms, uh, yeah. yes, it is, actually. It's about yes, it's about 600 mil. that's right, yes. And they're... Oh, 219 tubes, I think, if I remember rightly. Mm -hmm. Bloody awkward metric dimensions. Just over 200 diam uh, diameter tubes. In fact, so are the main booms to the trusses. They're 219s. Um, but we have, we've played games with the wall thicknesses of tubes to get consistencies in tube overall down to where we want them. And we tried to play what we thought were the right sort of games to get the proportions of all the tubes looking right, looking as though they were doing the jobs they were supposed to be doing. Um, and we did that by sometimes by juggling wall thicknesses. You see the sang on the uh, members that are turning on the knife, really. Yes, it's that's an interesting way. thing, of course, that you, when you draw these, these tension hangers, you, you, draw, you tend, both architects and engineers, tend to draw them in straight lines. The fact of the matter is that they're never straight because they have a weight of their own and you can never put sufficient load on them to pull them straight, so they sag. And the model we had made, lots of people threw their hands up in horror because, in fact, the tension rods are sagging. They don't look as if they're in tension. You know? <laughs> they're not bits of string anymore. Um, but the fact of the matter is that they do have a very gentle sag. And if you look along the line of them down the building, they all have precisely the same sag because we actually did, on this building, get our calculations absolutely right. Um, and our predictions on things like deflection and differential deflections and things, and it isn't more by luck than judgment, have actually come out quite right to within a millimetre in every case. I mean, we're never more than a millimetre out. I mean, you can talk about your mistakes, but I think you also, also can talk about your sort of uh, things that have gone right for a change. Um, that's a view looking down into one of the bays, as it were, from the outside. <coughs> Primary girders there and there, 13.4 metres apart. In that far bay beyond, you can see the secondary girders, which are plain lattice girders, six metre centres, uh, which span through there. Um, this is the thing that carries the plant deck at level one. That's the thing that carries the plant, the subsidiary, lighter plant at level two. And this zigzag stuff is all to do with bracing the building laterally, the, cent the central core, as it were, laterally, 
all pinned again. Um, and there's just a close-up detail of it there. I mean, it's, you know, pin on pin. We just sort of did everything the same way in the end. Um, with that the colour of the ceiling? Hmm? That the colour of the ceiling? No, that's the primer. That's the undercoat, rather. Uh, the final colour you'll see in a minute. It's much better than that. It's much stronger. It's about, it's about Hopkins House Blue, I should think, actually. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just quite nice. <coughs> a little bit washed out, but the final colour's smashing, actually, I think. <laughs> What? Tell you, what are those little barrels? Those are sort of... Um, uh, 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 they're, they're turnbuckles. They're solid, they're solid, they're, they're actually the solid, they're solid bottle screws with a left solid and right hand thread. Buttons. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yep. So you're not For tensioning. There. You're no. actually using no, no. a screw. Yeah, yes, um, that's right. On, on those points. You sometimes weld, you sometimes use a, a, a threaded connection. No, we haven't, there's no... <coughs> that's a threaded connection. That's a threaded connection. Yes. The, the primary parts are all welded in the workshop. There was no welding on site at all on this job. No. I, I love the idea of the welded end within the threaded connection. I must say that that's... Oh, I see what you mean about the welded end. Yes, yes, that's, yes, that's it is quite nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really winging it. How did you transport... What? <laughs> Sorry. How did you transport 38 metre beams here? We didn't. I'll show you in a minute. They were split into two. They were split down to 19. And that is the one place, the junction between those two, where we don't have a single pin connection. We have a multi-bolt. No, we couldn't do it. I think I've got a detail. Well, there you are. That's it. That's right. Yes. It's a fact that tube workers who made this structure for us as well have a, a factory in a, really in a field. I mean, it really is in a sort of... Um, uh, agricultural situation uh, at a place called Claverdon outside Warwick and I mean I don't know how they get their low load of trucks in and out at all but they do and it was a hell's own job to find the place but the the joint that we ended up with and I don't think I've got a slide of the bottom joint but it's the same as the top similar to the top one is that which is actually a fully bolted joint there so the end the two the ends of the tubes are capped off and then there's a, a, a fish plate, as it were, that comes out either side, and they're just bolted together like that with sufficient bolts to take it forward. Um, this gubbin is here. This is this is actually the end of the building, but it applies either to the end or to a courtyard situation. And I'm sorry, I haven't been able to. I haven't. I haven't got any slides of plans of this building. And I've got criticised for that recently. Um, we, that detail is the same as the one on the other side. That one takes a, a secondary girder coming in, which actually puts a slight eccentric load on this, this main girder here. And that eccentric load is actually taken out by that tie down into an anchor base in the ground, um, so there's no twist in it. Uh, but the other thing is that if we come to extend this building, and that is a standard detail. We take that out and we put the new truss in, and it balances out, so that we've gone the sort of standard detailing throughout. And that slide on the right is actually a junction between a secondary and a primary, looking up. A single pin again. Oops. Uh, yes, sorry, one other thing. On the left here, we, of course, have a tertiary structure which supports the roof deck. This is the beginnings of it here, which is a RHS sections supported off these tubes, tube hangers, with a bolt there, actually, and the deck is then, deck and its insulation, the whole makeup is laid on top of those there. What I should have put in, but I don't have a slide of it, this detail. Hmm? Is that a detail? No, I have a, I don't have a slide of it, I have a sketch of the whole sort of, um, I think it's probably a trade secret, though, I don't think I should go show it. Well, I think that's what I was saying. I don't think yeah, I should yeah, show that. that. Come on. You, you can draw it on the blackboard after Pierre, or I will. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. It isn't anymore. No. Because I sent it to Edinburgh University. Because they asked for it. Because somebody was doing a slung roof like this. And they said, how, did it, how, how could you do it? And I said, well, I'll show you. But I did it with permission from the office. Um... That's a view looking out across the primary and secondary girders from the central spine with some of the service, well, yeah, with the, the, the service stuff that's beginning to go in now. Um, and a view looking at the end of the building, which of course still got its bloody plywood cladding on the end. 
But um, this is the final colour. But I think you're beginning to see, one begins to see how it's coming together. Um, I'm looking for the end projection, actually, which I can't find two other shots. There's one other thing which I particularly wanted to talk about, but I don't know whether I have a slide of it. Um, yes, right, I do. Great. Um, they say that it's a repetitive thing that goes all the way along, but uh, at one time we had a we had linking members in here at the top, at level two, between the towers, which I didn't like at all, and I was determined to get rid of. Um, and I had, I got a whole series of sketches somewhere, which I tried to work out a bracing system which would eliminate those. And we managed to achieve it in the end. And how we achieved it was there's so many diagonals going on. Um, you, can, you can get a bracing system in here which is fine, a series of X braces where you need them, except when you come to the end. If you take a diagonal from there up to there and stop it, it's sort of unresolved and it tries to bend that tower backwards, and that won't do. So you say, okay, well, you take one down here, and you get to that point, and you think, well, gosh, I can't stop it there, you know. And I can run that in there, but no, I can't do that either. So actually, I've got to run that back there. And that works beautifully, and you do a closed diagram like that, and that's smashing. But you end up with half a bay of structure that you didn't actually bargain for, but it looks marvellous. <laughs> now, the thing about it is that it comes dead to the centre line, it's half bay, and therefore that's the linking point for phase two. So we thought, right, fine, that's it, done. And it costs very little to do that. Um, <laughs> Well, I mean, it's hardly any steel. I mean, there's only, there's only 35 kilograms a square meter in this building anywhere. Um, I like the argument that it's essentially making point for phase two, but you will be happy to the other end as well. You're not supposed to say that. No, <laughs> no. Right. In all fairness, it does, it does happen at the other end, but it's right at one end of the top. So you'd have to acquire the local roundabout in the main road. That's right. But you see, when we designed the system, we didn't. We, that's right, but we didn't actually know where, which way we were going to Correct. extend the building at one time. It was on the Bristol side, I think, in the middle of the part of the extension in both directions. We could directions. quite well have just extended both directions, so we, we got an answer for everything. <laughs> 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 and there, well, there wasn't a round side on the other side. Tony, could I ask about the uh, one sort of general question about these sorbent tension structures, which is always a problem? And that is when it is wind up there, mm. and you have to get the truss upper and stiffer uh, to deal with the wind up there, to a point where the tension members themselves tend to become redundant. And I, you know, I'm wondering what point you um, got to on this. Well, let me. I think I've got another slide which might show you something else that I wanted to talk about around that. Yes, I mean this will do. Um, I mean that's just a general. That's, that's, again, a very long focused lens, actually. Um, but one of the problems we did have around this, I mean, it was, it was partly around deflection and partly around wind uplift, Nick, is that um, we, we were trying originally to achieve these two primary girders that stuck out 38 meters either side with nothing happening at the outboard end when it became increasingly obvious that we couldn't do it. <coughs> A, because you've got actually too much downward deflection under certain loading conditions. So therefore we had, in fact, to put a very lightweight, but it is very lightweight, prop in there. And we, we got a bit of a bonus out of that because we did it as a, as a pair of props angled like that which gave us the stability down the side of the building that we wanted. And secondly, we have used that system there as a tie-down, because you get this business of uplift. And thirdly, we pre-tensioned those there, thus inducing a bit of twist, a bit of moment into that joint there, which has actually relieved a bit of the deflection along here, because we were still having slight deflection problems here. Because another problem about tension, so-called tension structures, is that when you put load on, every bloody thing stretches. 
you know, I mean, it's a fallacy to think that steel doesn't stretch when it's loaded, because of course it does, I and mean, you can calculate how much it stretches. But we had two problems here. We had, not only were the tension members stretching under load, but the towers it's themselves, under out of balance load, which we had to take, were rotating. And that was the first problem. They rotate, so they, they relax the load in the tension members, which means that the girders start to sag one side, and then the tension members take up again. And it was actually quite a complex design analysis, uh, analysis problem <coughs> um, with the various out-of-balance load cases that we had to work out the maximum deflections we might get. Um, uplift actually isn't a problem on this structure in the end. Uh, and neither, to our surprise, was vortex shedding of the tension hangers. I mean, we had to check all those things out. I mean, people say, you know, tension structures are simple, I mean, because tension is much easier to cope with than compression, because tension members don't buckle and all that, you know, you just put the load in and they just sort of go tight. And that's true, but um, the extra problems that you get <coughs> in um, analysis far outweigh the sort of apparent simplicity. I mean, I'm not saying they're not great fun to do, because they are, but they're actually quite hard work as well. Fun. And they're fun. Well, anything that's, I mean, Tell yes, that's right, anything question. that's hard work is fun. Yeah, I want to ask you a question. Um, when you're joining these two very trusses together, um, am I reading it right that that is the joints which we see sort of um, yes. the course way along on the... Uh, that's the, the that, is the, that is the joint there, yeah, Christopher, you've got top and bottom. Eight bolts, uh, four on each side that's of the right. top, and five on each side of the... That's right, because the, the forces are different. Now, the funny thing is, um, in your compression, uh, remember, you've got... So less bolts, bolts than you have no tension. tension yes, I wish you hadn't um, asked that, because I've got some more. I'm so funny, 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 more because you've got two at the top. <coughs> yes, thank you, Michael. Thank <laughs> you. Right. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. Right. We've actually got 16 bolts at the top. 16 <laughs> at the bottom. That's right. In fact, we've got eight at the top and five at the bottom because they pair up. They pair up, right. Yeah. yeah but yes, that's, that's quite right. Critical. One forgets, one forgets such yeah, vital, simple a, things. I must say, a lot of lovely detail. <laughs> Well, it's, uh, yes, we're, it's we're, taken quite, we're quite pleased with it. It's taken the whole sort of swim of the <coughs> structure beautifully. It's a difficult problem where to join it, actually. It was a hell of a problem where to join oh, it, actually. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's spot. right. It doesn't yes. appear to be anywhere in the, in, in, in the, um, in the compression room. <laughs> well, well we, had, we had lovely fun with the bottom one, though, because, you see, what we did was we cut away sort of nine-tenths of the tube but the last tenth, or whatever it is, and that is part of the tube. There's a brake joint there, of course, between the two, which you can't see in the slide. Ah. But there is one, ah. of course. Uh, but that tube has been cut back like that, you see? And then a plate, and, and then capped on the end, and then a plate welded in there. Oh, you can just see that line there. And then a big big cross. Why didn't you do it asymmetrically, I mean, at the centre of the lower face? Actually, I don't know the answer to that. That was a that was a decision. I mean, we asked for. <laughs> Did you? Yes. And the answer we got was that uh, I think you wanted it closer to the node than at the midpoint of the span between them. I can't imagine why. Actually, you know, Mike. Really. I mean, maybe it was Keith Ford. I mean, it is true to say that all these joints were worked out. I mean, they were worked out initially by us and Roger's office together, and quite early on, we, because we were in the fortunate position of being able to negotiate with the steelwork fabricator, we called them in and we developed the whole thing with them. We developed the joints, and at the same time, of course, we developed an erection technique, which was actually quite, quite something. I don't have any slides, actually, unfortunately. Yeah. You do. I must get some from it. Of putting the hangers up. Right. Because the hangers, I mean... Uh, they're rods, but of course they, you, a, you, you can't coil them or uncoil them. They have to come straight, and you have to put them up straight, but they're actually at an angle, and they're flexible enough so they don't sort of, they're not, you know, rigid enough to stay in position. So they had to build a special cradle, 
with the rods clamped in the cradle and it was lifted up, angled into position and then the pins put in um, and then you keep your fingers crossed to make sure which way things go when you sort of start releasing props and things. Um, it was a fairly complicated direction sequence but once they'd mastered it in fact it went incredibly quickly and incredibly efficiently and they didn't I mean there were no problems at all right? uh, I don't know I don't, I don't think I have any no that's all the slides I have I'm afraid that's I'm sorry uh, I have lots more but I thought that would probably be enough I mean that's oh, it's just 20 past 8 what are you doing? what? yes please <coughs> I'm the last person, I think, to uh, chair this discussion. Um, Robin press-cranged me into it, but uh, I have to say I've never met uh, Tony Hunt until this evening, apart from the rather boozy AA dinner we had last week where I saw him at a distance. Um, and I've never done a steel frame building in my life, so oh. I'm, I'm That's really... That's a chance. That's really... <laughs> <laughs> uh, miles, miles out. Easy, Jerry. Yeah. I'll um, give you a card. <laughs> the, other, the other thing is that while he's been talking, everybody's been sort of bubbling and wanting to talk about, about the details, and often, not very often, do architects get together and talk about these details in these formal meetings. Or this form. Um, and we don't with engineers. And I don't want, as it were, to get in the way of any discussion. Um, I mean, a lot of things crossed my mind while you were talking, which was the first is, how the hell did you ever get into this from the, uh, from the uh, education of an engineer? How do you work your way into a situation <coughs> where you're almost in bed with architects? Uh, if I can Ask put him it in there. <laughs> What's that? Asking when he's going to get registered. Or Talk, <laughs> talking the same language. I don't understand that. But talking the same language and, uh, uh, and, and getting down together, um, detailing these sort of very fine parts because they, you know these buildings depend an enormous amount on their detail. Um, Norman's not here tonight. And Richard's not here tonight. And I, I always said to them. <coughs> talk about detail and they never do when, when I'm around um, and it's very nice to hear the other side of the coin how do you get into this situation how do you design in detail with them how much um, comes from either side or is it is it totally in the melting pot and how much comes from the uh, steelwork fabricator and is there any way that this can be gelled off through an education system, or is it just that it happens by chance that this emerges through this almost uh, extraordinary education system that engineers have, where they have three years of highly academic education, and then they're sort of thrown out in this country into, mm. into a world to do detailing, and some of them do steel, and some of them do... They do concrete, concrete and, yeah, and some do timber. Do you want me to try and answer that? Well, I thought it was an interesting one, but I, I also feel that a lot of people bubbling over want to talk about your how many bolts and the top boom and uh, mm. the same mm. and the rest of it. But we can go. Yes, I'd like you to say something. Well, I'll try and answer that. I mean, in my particular case, I I was actually intre as, as as quite a young person. I was actually I don't know why really an accident, I suppose. I was always actually interested in design and I think if I'd had a slightly different background and slightly different encouragement from my parents I might have actually taken up architecture and but as it was I elected to to be an I, I wanted to be an engineer I thought at that time I got very disillusioned part way through because like you said, the training of engineers is actually awful, and it's not much better now, because it's very narrow, it's very academically based. Um, it normally doesn't mention the words architecture or design at all. 
doesn't accept the fact that structural engineers particularly spend all their life working with architects. They don't design things on their own. Um, but I, I was, I had a very, very unfortunate sort of early training. Or, but it, I mean, it, it worked out all right in the end because I, through a almost pure chance, I was sent on a course where there were a lot of people sitting around who were all talking about the things that were going on at the time. Uh, those things being primarily the Festival of Britain, which sort of dates me rather, um, more than somewhat actually. And I've, I've been going to the Festival of, Britain, Festival of Britain regularly, sort of almost every evening on my way home from the office, just to have a look. I had a, a season ticket. And I was fascinated by all the structures there. And as a result of that, wrote to um, Felix Samueli's office. And they gave me an interview. And Sammy was in the, in, in the States at the time. And Frank Newby interviewed me and gave me a job. <coughs> and it was a very sort of informal office at the time. And you were very much left on your own and left to pick up things that other people had sort of half done because they'd left or something like that. And um, it was through that. I stayed, I stayed at Sammy's office for seven years. And, I mean, I learnt an enormous amount from, I mean, I was there when he was still alive. I learned quite a lot from him, although I didn't have very close contact with him. I learnt a lot from Frank. I learnt a lot from the fact that we actually had architects in the office at the time, including John Prizeman, of course, which is where I met him. <coughs> and we used to sit next to one another at one time, because that was in the days when architects could do their year, their professional practice here in the engineer's office, um, which is an interesting thought. And so I, I mean, I began to learn about lightweight structures in all materials. I mean, timber, reinforced concrete, pre-stressed concrete, and steel. And um, began to take more and more of an interest in, in structures and architecture and design. And I think it's really stemmed from that. Uh, I worked for an architect for two years in an architect's practice, that is, uh, where I got to know a lot more, of course, about how architects think and how they work. And then that practice blew apart and I decided to set up and practice on my own. I've always been interested uh, particularly in, I mean, I showed two steel buildings. My particular speciality is structural steel work or, or, or metal things. I'm, because I'm interested in the way you put things together. I mean, I've always <coughs> been interested in that since I was very young. Um, I had a terrible reputation, actually, when I was a young kid. Of anything that could be taken to bits, I would take it to bits. But also, I'd learn how to put it back together again. Um, I'm not I'm sort of not a great expert at that, but I'm, I can usually take things to bits and put them back together again, including a, a wristwatch. And I, it's, it's been that sort of thinking. I, th I think um, much better in, in when I'm talking, when I'm working with sort of discrete elements than I do, for instance, with a reinforced concrete frame building. Although, I mean, some of our major stuff has actually been reinforced concrete uh, and I think quite successful is that getting on I think I've probably got off the point actually um, no, I, think I just like designing things mm -hmm. oh but another point that you made sorry how you know this collaboration thing I mean it's, I find it very difficult to explain because um, if you work closely with architects I mean, certainly on those two buildings I've shown, you know, I worked in very, very closely with the architects and all the other consultants as well. And it was a design team thing, really from pretty well from day one. Um, it's very difficult in the end to say quite who designed what. Because you're always talking about all these things, you know. Um, what do you do with certain bits of the cladding? What do you do with certain bits of the services? How do you integrate this with that? Um, and I don't think it's true to say that all the details that I've shown tonight, for instance, in those structures, are my invention or creation. They're not. They're <coughs> actually a part of a dialogue that's been going on between me and I the suppose I wasn't quite so concerned with who did what, but um, probably rising out of one of the examples you said where Norman came in one morning and white lipped said something's wrong. <laughs> yes, I hated that um, one. <laughs> I never quite got from that whether that was an aesthetic decision, a conceptual decision, or a structural decision.
decision. Oh. A bit of everything. Oh. And well, therefore, um, the question I was really going to ask is how much of your thinking um, uh, do, do aesthetic considerations uh, overlay structural ones? Where does the choice come in? Well, as far as I'm concerned personally, John, um, aesthetic decisions do come into thinking yeah. about the structure. Definitely. So I, I have a feeling that they come into almost all sorts of things, like designing, even designing aircraft. And oh, yes, I'm sure they do. Where the post office put their telegraph pole, that some chap has got some aesthetic theory as to why it should be there. It's usually the wrong one, but... Um, but he may have one. Yes. I, I think they do, and I think people who don't, who won't admit <coughs> to the fact that aesthetic decisions come in, or that you have a, a concept of what you want something to be, are either well. I, I think generally they're lying, in fact, mm. because I do think that that comes into it, and I think that one should admit to one's preferences. Um, you want things to be a certain way for certain reasons, and too bad. I mean, hopefully you're a good designer and they look good. If you're a bad designer, of course, they don't. But um, I don't see any reason why you should uh, shy away from that. I used not to take that attitude. I don't see any reason why you shouldn't say, you know, I, I always believe in, in designing economic structures, not necessarily right to the limit. Um, I'd like to give you an example of that in a minute, actually, because I think it might be... A, something everybody ought to know. I'll talk about that in a minute. But I do like to design them economically, but I also <laughs> like to think that they look right. Yeah. Well, there was uh, you know, great excitement um, from over there about the, um, um, uh, the cast steel triangular wall where they conical things on the end of... Um, on in the bars there. Now, the, the excitement they gave from mm, the excitement <coughs> there came from an aesthetic or from circular or a feeling that <coughs> aesthetically this was right structurally or, or a sort of fusion in your mind of all of the things. It just looked right. Or what was it? Because this is what we're all really nice. groping for. It was a fusion of structural aesthetics. There's no there's no demarcation line in my mind. But when you begin to analyse it, can you analyse it any further than that? How do you know, except by a, a trained how mind, and how do you know well, your mind is trained? I think this is, this, is, this is really Tony's um, question. <laughs> uh, you're not allowed. To, that's not uh, fair to pass that no, back to me. Right, but I, I will offer, I'll offer a, 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 a clue that you know, when, 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 when you're a designer, no matter what you're designing, whether you're designing some blades of a turbine or whether you're designing you know, a bearing for some incredible load, which is in the most incredible plastic, which steel is never even sort of matching. Um, you, 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 you're designing towards an objective, and it's the objective which is the all-important thing, um, not the means. And the means becomes a servant to the objective. Uh, and if you can design um, through means to be perfect, perfect answer to, to, to the objective. Aesthetics and structuralism are all byproducts. And in fact, you go beyond aesthetics and structuralism in a way. And um, maybe this is where Tony sort of <coughs> wins because he can see beyond both these components. And, and he has a feeling for it. That it has to be right for the job. And if it isn't, um, you know, what the hell is it? Get that thing in. Um, unless it's actually right for the job. Mm. Well, yes, there is, there is, there is one the thing I... The final objective has to be right. Mm. Yes. And, yeah. and it, it's not necessarily a structuralist or an aesthetician. But the, right. even the word objective presupposes that there, there's something there to, to which you're aiming at. So yes, we'll go there back is to, um, How to define Sandy that objective Wilson is another question altogether. Well, it must and be Sandy Wilson at Cambridge Sandy. talking about magic in putting the bits of the building together. Now, um, that magic, I don't know where it comes from, but I think the idea of that word was that it, it, uh, that, uh, it wasn't objective, 
that you were aiming for, and it wasn't just somewhere where you were building on the past. There was something that came in between the two. Does that sound metaphysical? I always get metaphysical. Sorry. I'm a bit very disappointed in Tony's answer weren't to do with econ uh, 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 just economy. economical structures. I don't mean money. I mean the way of actually getting a load from one place to another place in the most, in the most yeah. economical yes. way, yeah. and that may be very expensive. And I <coughs> wanted to ask a question about cost per kilogram and those two structures that you showed us, Tony. I don't know whether that sort of information is easily retrieved from the back of your head. Well, I know what the information is. I don't know that I actually want to give it. <laughs> no, I mean, nobody's asking you to break trust. So no, no. It's a very easy thing no, to do. No, I'll even work it out for yourself. I mean, if you go to the right documents, in fact, there's no secret about it. Um, it is true to say that Inmos structure is much lighter than Sainsbury Centre. Um, is that because there's more tension? <clears throat> Partly, you've got two yes. things, you? You've got, Partly. You've got, you've, got, well, you've got cost per kilogram and number of kilograms per square, per square meter. Yes, that's right. That's two things that are very important. That's right. Do you aim yeah. at uh, <laughs> bearing down the structure? Mm. Yeah, always. Is there a point at which <coughs> you stop? The only point at which we stop is, um, and I'll give you the example I was just thinking about just now, and that is, and it's on a, a structure that we've been working on with Michael Hopkins here, and we've designed this very lightweight steel frame structure, which in one direction was at one time held up, and that is really the word, by one X brace like that either side, at four ends of which were a six millimeter diameter pin, and that was all, and that's fine and it works perfectly structurally, it all looks okay in the calculations. But the guy who's actually been designing it with me came in late one evening to the office and said, I've been thinking about that express, Tony, you know, he said, if one of those pins failed or some idiot got up there and took it out, the whole structure would go back. <coughs> Don't you think we ought to have a bit of redundancy built in? And I said, yes, I do, actually. So we have two expresses per side. <laughs> yeah. Now, strictly, according to the calculations, you don't need this. And one has to be a bit careful about this. It's not a thing, you know, so that if you're, des if you're trying to design to the limit all the time, which we are, we, you know, within reason, um, you wouldn't actually want to put those two expresses in. You'd only want to put the one in. Um, and you can't fine it down much more than a six mil pin anyway. Pretty small. So we have two sets of systems. Down, you can spend more on the details, can't you? Yes, you can. I mean, that's right. So yes. I mean, that's, in fact, that's what. The tonnage price <coughs> per meter. You, you see, that's what's happened on Inmos. We've got the tonnage down and, and, so and spent there's, there's something on the details. But yeah. in fact, it's still a very cheap frame. Incredibly cheap. <coughs> Compared with a, a conventional building, it, it's a winner, is it, economically? Mm. Yes, it is, actually. Mm. Yeah, it really is. The interesting thing. And we're really quite surprised yeah. at how, <laughs> life and how cheap it is in the end. Quite surprised. Because we thought it was going to come out higher than that in the end. And still be sensible and economic. Well, Tony, could you go back to the sort of having problem with the details? And there's vast new technology of detailing about to break on us, I suppose, and sort of carbon fiber technology and things like that. I, I, I don't know yeah, how, possibly. Um, how, how true or how sort of, uh, sort of starry um, this is. And talking to the six millimeter pin, um, if, if you were talking about a material which isn't um, um, steel, um, or something totally different, I mean, what sort of um, advances can you see you as a structural engineer are going to make? Um, Next ten years, so. I, that's, a, that's a difficult question to answer, actually, um, because I mean, it was Ted Happold had said recently at a, a, a conference I was at, you know, that innovation is the is the most difficult thing. I mean, there is hardly any such thing as innovation. It's well, it actually a slow industry. progression <laughs> of design <coughs> development. Yes, you know. in, in aerospace, I suppose. Yeah, um, 
new technologies are appearing. I'm just wondering. Yes, are they are. But you are see, the demand because, because the demand is there. You yes. see, in aerospace, because it's a it's a much more severe demand than the one that we have as structural engineers and builders. Mm -hmm. Of course. Well, we actually, I think, feed in the style rather than the actual engineering. Culture. Well, this is actually. We yeah. Most is of it. But you see, we 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 could produce well, a very much about this sort of stylistic transference from aerospace. Technology oh, I don't think you should get me on to that tonight, actually. No. I think you, I might take off on that. No. <laughs> Sorry, that wasn't meant to be a that. fun. What I would like to ask, <laughs> yeah, back to my point, is um, what practically can you see um, in the sort of, you know, foreseeable future um, a real technological transference from the kind of, of, of materials... Um, well, I can tell you what I think the material of the future is, structurally. And it's glass, yeah. definitely. I don't mean in sheet form like the windows, but it's definitely glass. I think there's no doubt about it. What, as a reinforcement or something? Yeah. 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 Is that because of strength to weight ratios or what? It's an amazing beautiful, material, beautiful, well, beautiful, way, beautiful, way under used and developed so far. How does the I strength think to weight ratio compare with? Oh, God, I can't, I'm sorry, I, I can't tell you what happened. Glass is marvellous in compression. So, I mean, if you send it's pretty good in tension, too. Glass well. oh, yeah. well, didn't they? Well, glass fiber. Tony, yeah. can I ask that question going backwards? What's actually happened since. Because, you know, what, since way, Brunel? Well, yes. Because, <laughs> yeah, Not it. much. <laughs> no, because there's a lot, you know, those are stunning structures. I can tell, tell you what's happened, really, I think, since what Brunel. the material sense and technology sense, that, I mean, things have happened. In well, steel and welding. Yeah, and, and yes. So I mean, what the, actually are these? There's there's well, there are several important things. I mean, certainly, I mean, in Brunel's time, for instance, Brunel didn't actually have steel. He had wrought iron. He had cast iron and wrought iron. Steel has, I mean, steel was developed and it's been developed and developed until it's a very much higher quality and higher strength product than it was at the end of the 19th century, for instance, early 20th. I mean, its, its properties have gone up and up and up. Um, but they've gone up probably... Well, I was going to say they've gone up as far as they, they can, but I don't think that's quite true, because we designed a structure recently, which unfortunately we didn't, didn't build. In fact, it was, it was a... It was an alternative structure for Norman Foster's house, which he didn't even bother to comment on, which I think was slightly foolish of him. And I would have said it if he'd been here. Um, because we designed a structure in steel, in a special sort of steel. Actually in Reynolds 541 tubing. Not 531, but 541, I think that's the number. Which is very high strength, very thin wall, which and the weight of the structure was less than the weight of the aluminium structure that we'd done for him in his house. <laughs> Which is actually quite significant if you think about it. Yourself, you're Reynolds <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, uh, yeah. Reynolds the Reynolds Award. Yeah, but which Reynolds? But not the Reynolds Tube Award, the Reynolds Award. That's right, well, maybe. Um, and, I mean, I didn't mean to get onto this subject, and I'll shut up in a minute. But to me, it was a, it was a much more appropriate structure as, as something that had to sit on the ground and, and, and not sort of take off. When did welding then, come in? When did people learn Well, well, welding actually well, came in in the twenties. Well, sorry, yes, I got well, off that. Yes, got off that. Off on, you know. Well, welding was one of the things that was really very largely developed by Samueli. I mean, he's not very well known for it, but in fact, he he wrote an enormous n number of papers to the Welding Institute. He did an enormous amount of research, and it's largely through him and him alone that welding is where it is today. That was the thing that he developed. Uh, before that, it was riveting and bolting. And that's, that's, that is a major advance, certainly. Um, the quality of steel. Um, general fabrication techniques have improved enormously. Uh, what else? Well, the, the question of uh, high-strength friction grip bolting, of course, which didn't exist in, in, until uh, probably the 50s, I think, but I'm not sure. I mean, I'm not, I'm not an engineering historian, um, but I think probably that technique... What industry did welding actually war. first come into? As far as, well, it gave very large yeah, structures. Well, shipbuilding and structures. Well, riveting, I mean, riveting was for ships or for a long 
Riveting was for ships, riveting was for structures. I mean, things mm -hmm. like the fourth bridge and much later structures than that. I mean, Grosvenor House, for instance, a steel frame for Grosvenor House, which I think was built in 1929, and was a fairly major achievement at the time, was all riveted, which is an incredible technique. I mean, ridiculous, actually. This like, <laughs> hot <laughs> thing. <laughs> yeah, it's noisy and dangerous. A number of people have been killed and maimed for riveting is, you know. Um, there's another problem. What are, there are other, sorry, there are, there are, are other later advances, though. Sorry, uh, Chris. And that is that, I mean, the only major advance, I think, really, is in, in the last sort of... No, there have been two, really, I think. One is in shell concrete structures. Oh, yes. Really developed primarily, I think, by Felix Candela. Part of it, somewhat by Toroya, the Spanish engineer. Um, Quite a lot of pretty sophisticated reinforced concrete developed by people like Nervi and Morandi. Um, and the other thing, of course, is membrane structures, which have been developed by people like Fry Otto, um, who actually is an architect, not an engineer. I mean, he may be an engineer as well, I'm not sure. Hmm? He doesn't want to be an architect. <laughs> he doesn't, but he is, isn't he? No. No? He's not. What is he? Is he an engineer or not? He worked for Strohmeyer as a, as a design. Oh, right. Tents, you know, in his youth. Yeah, that's right. Oh, he never yes. Yeah. But the whole, the whole membrane tent thing has been developed to a pretty sophisticated degree now. Um, and it's being promoted by manufacturers and a very few designers, architects and, stru and structural engineers. Not very many, actually. Um, I mean, we have one person in our office who's an expert in tents. Nobody seems to think so, but he is, actually. Um, he actually worked for Happol for a time, which is where he learned it. <laughs> um, I know one or two other people who are even more expert. Not much else. Is one of the uh, advances concerned with fireproofing? Yes, because, um, I was going to say. Well, one of the problems with steel structures, mm. of course, is um, is fire. In buildings mm. is fire. Uh, yes. I wonder if a lot has been developed, particularly in the petrochemical industry. <laughs> in advance of the building industry in relation to fireproofing steel structures. I'm not sure about that, but certainly there have been quite a lot of significant developments in structural and uh, in structurally in the last 10 to 15 years. I mean, there are, I mean, apart from the conventional ways of, of cladding the steel so that the fire can't get at it to raise its temperature sufficiently so that it will fail, there are now, I suppose, three accepted, two and a half, actually, accepted techniques fireproofing steel. One is the water fill, which doesn't work in all instances because you can't, for instance, get a water circulation system going where you have major horizontal runs of structure, as happened in the Centre Bourbourg, I think, didn't it? Yes, they had a problem. The vertical thing. That's right, the vertical thing works beautifully, but the horizontal <laughs> won't. Um, there is intumescent paint, but it's not all that great, and it's true to say that a lot of district surveyors in London, for instance, won't accept it. There's an absolute <coughs> ban on it in London. You can get it accepted in other places. We have actually used it. Um, there is another technique which sounds a bit archaic, but actually works rather well, and that is to concrete fill <coughs> um, steel tubes, and the concrete acting then as a heat sink. And not, not only does it give you the fireproofing that you want, you can get up to two hours, but it also gives you quite an increased load-bearing capacity in columns. And it's a technique that we've been using. Well, we've used it on Warwick, for instance. Where is it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Where are you there? Um, that's beginning to be quite successful. But I don't, nobody's, unfortunately, produced a sort of magic solution yet that will fireproof steel. And I wish to God I could invent it, you know, because it would, you know, <laughs> 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 it would revolutionise so much. I mean, Bush Lane House, for instance, you know, the sort of multi-X braced thing, that sort of mini miniature mega structure thing. Mm. Yeah. Well, there are stainless steel tubes with hollow nodes. It's all water filled, and it works because they're on the diagonal and not on the horizontal. There's no horizontals. And that works very well. Why won't it work in the horizontal? You can't the get the convection, convection currents don't work. Yeah. You see, it's as simple as yeah, that. Yeah, they go up and down, you know. Don't you get the steam or something? Yes, that's right. You get steam block, you see, yes. 
you get vapor locks, in yes. fact. Right. One thing we didn't come for the vapor lock. One thing we looked at on Pompidou was a uh, material which NASA were developing at the time for protecting their tank launch towers, which is a material which sublimes. <coughs> so you get the advantage of latent heat of change of state of the material, mm. which is more sophisticated than instrumental paint. Yeah. It does work, it's very effective, but it's staggeringly expensive. Mm. Yeah. Well, it's, good it's not the sort of thing you can it's yes, it can turn from the solid to the vapor mm. state. Well, well, sulfur does yeah. that, doesn't it? Doesn't it make your cool boy experiments when you sublime sulfur in the you know, glass tube? It's, it's more expensive yeah. to do yeah. it. It takes more. Oh, it's very expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, you don't have all the weatherproofing mm. properties of normal mm. finishes and so on. But you do this inside the tube, don't you? Don't you? Yeah, you certainly couldn't risk yeah. it on pump. <laughs> so I think the two, the um, interesting thing about both buildings that you've shown is that they, the thing they both have in common is that the, uh, I mean, they're both very exciting buildings and I think the reason why they're exciting is because um, that at, the very, at the root of, of the uh, architectural um, idea is a structural idea and you can't actually tell where the structure finishes and the architecture begins and the, the two you know, the whole set of decisions, architectural and structural decisions, are so uh, interweaved, or whatever you call it, that they're, they're totally inseparable, really. Um, and well, that's why I like working with certain architects. And, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, I because mean, you get that integration with... And the question of what happens since, you know, people were talking about Brunel a while ago, well, that is something that couldn't have happened in Brunel's time, you, know, you couldn't have had you know, an architecture which was Didn't actually the happen, structural idea. It sort of somehow happened without us in um, those days. I mean, well, yeah, we're working, we're working on it. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's actually the thing that fascinates me. I mean, what, no, but Brunel, yeah, right. no, Brun, Michael Brun, Brunel was fortunate enough to, to, to get enough commissions whereby he didn't need an architect because he was really producing almost pure engineering. I mean, if you look at the Saltash Bridge, or, um, gosh, I can't think of anything else he did now. But he did engine ships um, and yeah, stations. Yes. Oh, that's yeah. quite true, but they're not very good architects. Well, when he, when he got onto the station, they, they covered it in with stones, didn't they? Yeah. 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 Bristol. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Bristol, yeah. Temple Meads, yeah. actually. Temple Meads, yeah. 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 So, so yeah. 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 leading on from that, Sorry, I was trying What's Paddington? Paddington? I mean, the whole, we're talking about sort of quality. Smashing. Can you sort of encapsulate in a few sort of sentences what you think is a is a quality structure. Mm. Oh, gee, the, two, two, the, the two structures we've seen are quite mm. fairly different, aren't they? I mean, yes, one, they are. one, you know, is a suspended thing, and the other is a, um, a truss assisted structure. Um, assisted, yeah. assisted, yes, that's right. Yes, right. yes, right. yes, yes. Right. yes. I mean, um, can how I? Would, <coughs> how would you? How do you know when you've arrived at a, a quality structure? Oh, yeah, yeah. Ticket, don't you? Give it ten that's right. When you stop asking you to do another one. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yes, yes, that's right. When the architect says, right. right. <laughs> in a way, right, let me say, let me put No, it. no, I, um, I, I don't know how to answer that. this is tied in with the talk about Brunel because a structure today, is, you know, is bred in ambiguity. It has to do so many more things than just stand up. You've got to enclose the building and you've got to deal with services which are, you know, terribly complicated. And a pretty major thing. So this is, you know, it's a much more difficult thing today to bring out the structure and make that something of a building than it was building a Gothic cathedral or a Brunel Bridge. Um, and this is what I think is so remarkable about these buildings because it, We've not talked about services, but they wouldn't no, be like no. they were exactly. without high, being highly serviced buildings mm, and yes. this idea being separated out and then integrated back into the structure. Um, so, uh, you're, you know, you're I'm absolutely right. While you're you're, you're ab ab so. absolutely right there. I mean, I, I should have talked very much more about services because in both those buildings and in, in pretty well all other buildings these days, um, the services are actually a major, of, of, of major importance and a major content. I mean, particularly on the Inmos thing, but that's a rather special case. Um, it's more than fifty percent. It's the more. Cost. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I mean, the structure is nothing compared with the services. You know, I mean, it's 
really. Well, the other question I wanted to ask, actually, moving on from that, was that... I'm going to answer the other one first. Oh, well, yes. I mean, well, they're, I don't know that I can, but... They're both <laughs> fairly... I mean, superficially, they're, they're sort of similar in, in the sense that they're both... They're only similar column. in that they're built out of steel well, circular tubes. Well, they're tubes. steel frame, but they're also column-free spaces. You know, they're quite... They're yes. single-story, column-free spaces. Um, and yet, they, they are quite different structures, aren't they? I, what I wanted to ask you was whether... You know, what actually generated that difference was 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 that because um, one of the one of the buildings needed services at the perimeter and the other needed services at the centre, or you know, what was it was it was that difference generated by services? Do you think? Or yeah, I think was it was. Difference? I mean, that's quite a, that could be quite a long discussion. Mm -hmm. But to answer that, um, is, is this good structure mm -hmm. thing to do with being able to see what's going on? I, I was going to ask you about hmm. um, the difference between concrete structures, which I know you do, I and mean, you've had a couple for us, yeah. and steel mm. ones, that it's very much more difficult, um, unless it's something like a Nervian building or something, which I would to, love to see mm. exactly what's going on in a, in a concrete structure. And that's what's so. Well, unless you take Alexander Road. Yes. I mean, you can, it's all yes. concrete, and you can see exactly what's going on. But there. that's what's so kind of really fantastic about the Inmos thing, because you can see almost every, you know, what's happening at every point. Yeah. Um, yes. You can't see it, to my mind, quite so easily at the Sainsbury Centre. You, you, you wonder, no, you, you want it to be a, a two-pin portal going straight over the top and down to the ground again. Well, and then when you look at the detail, you can see it's not. Why wasn't um, it actually? But, um, on, Why wasn't it? Well, hang on, hang on, one question on, at a time. On, on, on the, concrete, the point I was going to say put was, People tend to revert to concrete if they've got, and I, I suspect perhaps this happened a bit at the Ipswich building, um, where you've got an irregular shaped site and you've got a lot of cantilevers and things like that. You can lose reinforcement in the slab. You make, make mm -hmm. kind of bits of cantilever and, and bits of, um, um, uh, you know, pack in a bit of reinforcement and still keep the beam the same size and so on. Right. You can do things within sort, it. Sort of fudge it inside, yeah. yes. And, and, mm. Well, um, there's a certain amount of that. Yeah. then becomes not nearly so understandable to the yeah. uh, to the person looking at it. And, and when people look at steel structures where they can see exactly what's going on, they they get a, in, in a sense, a bigger... Well, it's I, I've got a million and one questions people are asking, actually. <laughs> um, I mean, just to take you up on that, the Willis Faber building, for instance, we worked and worked for a long time trying to produce a steel structure, and we all agreed in the end that it was actually not the right thing to do. And we would be much better, because we had to have fireproof floors, <coughs> because we had to have a fireproof structure, in the end we decided to opt for a reinforced concrete structure. Uh, also, because we had that amorphous shape, um, I mean, we had a hell's own job trying to find a grid that would fit that thing at all. Um, but it did come out in the end. And we got that marvellous 14 metre square grid with that necklace of columns that went all around the outside on just about 7 metre centres, if I remember rightly. And then the cantilever out. And it all sort of hung together rather nicely in the end. You're right, of course, about being able to sort of pack the re extra reinforcement into odd places to take account of odd conditions that you get. And, I mean, both the Sainsbury Centre and the Inmos thing are sort of linear buildings, which are quite finite things. And they're also single-storey sheds, basically, um, which makes a hell of a difference. Um, the services thing, well, I mean, Sainsbury Centre is not air-conditioned. It's, it's ventilated, mechanically ventilated, but I'm still right, aren't I? It's not air-conditioned, is it's it? It's a little bit of air-conditioned. Is that? Yeah. Where? For the study reserve. Yeah. I didn't know that, actually. Yeah, but it was always the idea that you could put that in for the at a, at a later date. But the policy yes. on the campus was that no buildings in the university should, should be air conditioned. Should be air conditioned, so that's right. That was a yes, starting point of the brief. Yeah. And, so you, but you, and, and it's right to say that you have service centres mm -hmm. down either side of the building, which are, are fitted in within the structure. And that was a quite sensible and logical thing to do, I think, in that case. In the case of Inmos, I mean, it became apparent quite early on that, I mean, they had this staggering services requirement. Was it five megawatts for yeah. electricity? Five I mean, that's just one thing, you know. I mean, enough to run a town of 20,000 people and 
all these rare gases and this and that and deionized water and it's actually it. largely and held up on bus bars not the structure yeah, so. yeah that's <laughs> yes, right um what's in those big boxes in um, well, they're at air handling units. Um, well, you have to start off one that, like that, don't um, I mean, <laughs> Oh, well, not entirely true. Not entirely true, no. Tony's really electric, so I shouldn't really answer the question. No, but it's that really the, the form of the organization arose from a fairly critical analysis of their existing facility in Colorado Springs. Um, where we concluded that the services should be right in the centre of the building, it should be above the heart of the building, uh, which was independent of a, an image we had in our minds at that time. But, but originally, uh, sorry to interrupt, that, but originally we had them below, if you remember, also, in a great big thing, duct that ran well, down was, the spine that was early on. Zone. It wasn't the plant zone. We were going to put plant on that one time, weren't we? Oh no, we weren't, no, sorry. And basically no. the, the central... It didn't work anyway. Got a short well, so the cost of the services actually bends the design of the building. The cost of the services, the fire risk associated with the particular sorts of services they're using in the industry, makes you think differently about services even than you do services in a normal building. For example, fire, the, the greatest risk in the industry is fire risk in air ducts, which immediately, very early on, said, well, maybe we should be putting our duct work outside. For that reason alone, which is one factor. Um, Secondly, we put our, our main plant in the centre of the building and reduce our duct runs to the minimum. Um, thirdly, we incrementalise the plant deliberately because if there is a major failure in one part of the plant, producing microchips is the fundamental goal. They cannot turn that process off. They keep going, whatever happens. So risk in terms of plant operation is critical. So you deliberately chop the plant down into incremental units. Uh, then the other thing that's constant in the industry is uh, continuing change of their process. They say in two years they can completely throw out the process and start another one. So in fact, uh, and we analysed the buildings in Silicon Valley, where they're really continuously jackhammering. They buy a pre-packaged structure, a lift slab building, and then they, they make chips and then they close down for two weeks and they bring in the jackhammers and they rip out major portions of the building, mm -hmm. re-equip it at the most incredibly fast time scale. So an American servicing engineer is really working round the clock and then back on again for another eight months and then stop again and rip it all out again. And this it must is designed so that you can do that and keep the plant running all the time. That's essentially what it's about. But it's air handling. It's air handling. Mm -hmm. We yeah. have air changes of 480 air changes an hour. Some parts of that. Well, you're into scales of air, of servicing concepts are well beyond anything we do. Absolutely colossal air changes. And now we change all the air in Wales once a week. I keep saying it's the cleanest place in the country to go on holiday. If not the nicest. Inside, the thing that's a little bit. Sad for Pierre and myself, but Pierre's really spent a vast amount of time really organising the building in terms of the actual shell and interiors. And the clean room is really quite superb inside, and it will never be seen because the process is a mm. trade secret. Mm. Yeah. And it's yeah. the most extraordinary 100 metre long white room. I should have put, I've got some size of that actually, I should have put them in. And the cleanest area in Europe, sort of. Yeah. <laughs> quite nice. And with no constraint at all, with minimal volume and so on. And amazing density, I don't know how many hundreds of kilometres of pipe work there are and all sorts of nasties. And it's tremendously product-oriented, that building, brilliant. And again, in terms of the design process, if you were designing a normal factory, you'd be looking uh, right from the start at the, at the raw material coming in and the fridges going out of the other end and the way you saw what fridges being made and put through. In Inmos, you can take a year's production out in a suitcase. <laughs> So the whole, even that sort of yeah, yeah. way of thinking about architecture yeah. goes out of the window. Yes. And, yes. And so we have a lot of fundamental surprises in, in working for the microchip industry. It really is the first high-tech industry that we've really got tangled with. And it really is quite fascinating. But the building really did, is very much a derivation from what they think. And it's all fair to, fair to say that it wasn't us thrusting the design upon Inmos. They said, we want the most flexible building that you can give us. And that we guarantee, right through your design process, we will be continuing to evolve our design process. And that we'll be mucking you around right until the last day. And I can assure you on site, 
fear in myself of tearing out hair because they are still designing things and changing things right now. And uh, as, as, certainly as much as they were earlier on, halfway through the design process, said, sorry, we need more lab space, move the courtyard. And we built it at that time. It took us a week to change it with the structure that we had. Yes, they do, and that's why there's that, that grid Small pattern. Grid. They say they'll punch everything through the cladding over time, so you can forget any aesthetic. You can't <laughs> read Harold Grimshaw on the side. You know. <laughs> <laughs> they'll punch vents, ducts, extracts, all sorts of things. So you give them a small so you give them cladding? Yeah, quite a small. Mm -hmm. well, it's, it's, it's all glasses, isn't it? Glass yeah. and On the production side, it's all sandwich solid panels. It's a double scheme in the inside. It's a double scheme in the inside. It's a PVF to finish. Yeah. Uh, what's the grid? Gr gr 120. Oh, the grid. Oh, it's about four foot square. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. There's obviously an yeah, aesthetic fail safe in <laughs> having the aesthetic <laughs> in the structure. Yeah, because if everything else can be punched and pulled out, that's right. Out, they will wreck everything. They can't wreck the structure. structure. Yeah, that's, that's right. Fall down on top of you. So that's a, that's we, a real we, fail. We've safe. actually made allowances mm. for that too, <laughs> <laughs> because if they put if they put actually plastic explosive on some of the tension hangers on on one thing, on on one main um, structural girder, it will sag like crazy if some of the tension hangers fail. Mm. But it won't actually bring the building down. I mean, we did check that out. Was it in your mind to have a centimeter? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Was it in your mind to have a really sort of great structure that became sort of the architecture, so that they could actually bash fence and things in? Yes, basically. Yeah, aesthetic. Mm. Yeah, so I'm sure comes to a lot of it. It's basically a, a big mother hen, a big sort of umbrella, big mother hen sitting over it, and underneath all the chicks could really do what they want. Really. And it's been very much like that. The whole of the clean room is is a kit system. I think it's totally way, I might like it better when that's happened a bit. Mm. Yes, yeah. I'm sure. But it's been less about it. A little, little bit mm. 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 Actually, it has happened on the roof, hasn't it? Yes. Some of those shots on the roof, you can barely see the structure. No, that's true. <laughs> well, like, well, I mean, so when they get going on the side. Oh, wow, yeah. yeah. So David Barnett yeah. phoned up from the site last week and said they put a whopping great uh, specialist gas sensing system up on the roof that we knew nothing about. They need tell us. So we found it on the roof. Mm -hmm. It was arrived, plopped in by a train. But all penetration so far. Mm. Yeah. One question that I'm, I'm eight, itching eight, to eight, ask eight. you is... Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. I think they're going to go off and have their own conversation. Mm -hmm. No, I was just, it was just one question I was itching to ask, which is how much do you use models and full-size models in putting together steel details? Because having worked um, related to the shipbuilding industry in the, in the Navy, they actually make everything, in, albeit in mahogany, full size, uh, that's made of steel, um, to see whether it works and all the rest of it, not actually for aesthetic reason. And do you put things together much in models, or do you do it all in sketching? No, we do a certain amount of modelling. I mean, some of the joints, for instance, on in Moss, we made uh, yeah, we made models in the office. Uh, some of the parts we had prototyped up for size. <coughs> mm. um, on not so much on the Sainsbury Centre. Um, I think the only time we had things made up full size was when we actually wanted them test tested, mm. as I described on that funny sort of joint thing right there. Mm. Um, we didn't. Uh, we didn't make any other models. Uh, on Inmos, we had a model of the whole structure made, to quite small scale, but very, very accurately. Um, I'm amazed you don't have a slide of that. Mm. Very is this for you or to tell other people? Yeah. Or I, the I don't know why the hell I didn't put it in it. Yeah, so it's silly, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's just we've just put it into the Royal Academy that model. Yeah. I think it'll be rejected, but you know. No, Never know. I'll, it might not be. I'll try and make it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes. Um, which means we've lost the model. Well, Richard said it's all right. Yes. No, well, it isn't his model, actually. It's mine. Because we commissioned it. I mean, he's got his own model. They have their own model in Moscow. We, had our, we, we thought the structure was so important that we had a model of it made mm. ourselves. Um, because we wanted to see what it all looked like when it was all sort of put together. 
And okay, I think this that was, was for you to see, or this was, no, this was for us to see. For you to see yourself. Yes, that's it was right. a design tool. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And we had certain parts of the mm. structure made. I mean, people who were working on the project made their own models of certain joints, for instance. Um, I mean, I should perhaps I should have shown sides of those as well. Because one of the quite young design engineers in the office made up a series of models of the outboard end of the truss in different configurations, because we'd been juggling about with all sorts of different ideas. Um, and it was through that, making those models, and in fact we came up with the solution that everybody said in the end was the right one, definitely. <coughs> and that's the one that exists on the building. And I've still got the model in my office. It's only made out of cardboard tubes, which he took home one night and sprayed up white. We were stiffening the plates and everything, you know, but it's, it's absolutely perfect, it's just like it, it's got built. And they are important, I think. But I don't think one should place too much importance on models. I mean, I think you can go absolutely mad and um, end up by being building models and never drawing anything. Mm. And I'm not sure that that's right. I think that drawing is the main communication tool. Drawing is the main communication mm. tool. Yes, that's right. And drawing both in um, orthogonal and axonometric. I mean, that's that's the way I design. And I mean, one other thing. Somebody said something earlier. Christopher, I think it was. Um, it's true of both the Sainsbury Centre and in Moss and a lot of other structures that we've done that they are actually designed in a creative way, if you like, and drawn before they're calculated. And that's the way I work and the way we work. And I think that's fairly unusual. The last thing you do, in fact, is to go and calculate the bloody thing. You know, to me, making a structure is actually designing it first and calculating it afterwards is design and analysis. Which means you've got to have a fair amount of experience about what you're doing, otherwise you'll get it wrong. And I'm, I mean, sometimes I get it wrong, you know, and I go back <laughs> to my office after a meeting and they say, Tony, you know, it just won't work. <coughs> But that oh, is the shit, I got it wrong again. Yeah, that's but, the nature, um, isn't it, of the design process that you you postulate something well, I and think, then test it. I think and it, it is. always has been so. But that's not the way the structural field. engineers are trained. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, no, back to what think, people were saying that, earlier. That you see, you make about postulation is a key to the way Tony works with architects. Is that both the architects of the two buildings have shown enjoy the process of postulating talking about clarity, talking about the integrity of a particular sort of solution, before there's any final formal position taken, you throw around ideas together. And that's, that's very right. much part of the game. You yes. actually both are prepared to make fools of yourself in a frame yes, of Yes, that's yes, each other. Yes, that's right. And that really is what builds yeah. into a good working relationship. You get close enough together so you're not afraid of each other and you're not worried about your covering your tail in terms of your professional responsibilities. You're both absolutely in it together. Going back, yeah. going back to the and it's story. fun. Yes, yeah, it's fun. Going back to the early part of your talk, you described how Norman came in with uh, very tight lips on one morning. Yes. One morning. You keep on going back to that. And, and, well, I just wondered, and, you know, what what it was oh, actually yeah. that. That's oh yes, yeah, I never that, answered that, that question. Very dramatic that. change, you know, from. Well, the, I think I think the, that he thought, and quite rightly so, actually, that the. Um, the aesthetics of the thing were wrong. That we had what was quite a sound structure and, 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 and quite a good building, but actually it was a bit Victorian. What's the skin in, in what place, Denny? Hmm? What's the skin in a different place underneath this? Well, yeah, it was in two places. It was either inside or outside. We had two options. We had two alternatives. It was in the... Uh, yes, in the, in the slide I showed... Slide I showed, yes, that was right. Um, the inside. skin was slung un underneath, yeah. but in fact, I also have some slides of the model, of another model, with the skin out on the outside. Structure, yeah, well, it was. It was, it was massive. Point. I mean, it really was a bit. Hmm? For, those, for those of us who've seen sort of Richard and Norman lecture recently, they've always been at loggerheads so about one issue, and that is whether you express structure or not. Well, and Norman always find, finds that. But, but, no but Norman, it's quite interesting, quite but Norman quite always chickens out in the end, and Richard doesn't. Norman, 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 Norman,
are very much less dramatic than the other Yes. Shed. You can't yeah, have it both ways. You've got to have it you on can't. the outside. <laughs> the inside. You can't have it Nobody will ever be allowed in, he said. But, 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 yeah. but, yeah. but, but, yeah. in, in Sainsbury's, it's not on the outside. It's all the inside. Inside. No, <laughs> no, it's on, no, the structure's on the inside. Well, yeah, yeah, but very much so. Got a skin, you've got a skin on the inside of the structure, so it's actually... Well, you've only got these... Aluminium louvers. Well, the the inside is a wonderful yes. magical mm -hmm. space yes. there. Yes. Which I, and I don't think one could quite say the same for the outside. You know, uh, you go as far as to say it's a I, huge bus left in the field, but... I uh, find the outside hasn't got sort of... No, not, not, not so interesting, actually, as, as, as the inside on, on St. Louis Centre, certainly. Why did you um, decide to go for power? Can I go construction now from a portal frame with a fixed pit joint? I think really, I mean, in, 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 in the sort of short answer is that the, the portals really were very heavy weight. I mean, to, to achieve that span, which isn't all that great, I admit, um, we were coming up with something which was a fairly massive bit of solid structure, which looked a bit, it did Dancy actually look a bit Victorian. Mm -hmm. Once Arcee Thompson would have thrown it out straight away, it just yeah. looks very, very heavy. I mean, yes, he would, wouldn't he, actually? Yeah. Yes, that's right. Because it's hard, it's, it's twice it's as big as it ought to be. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. In terms of its span. Yes. Yeah. You'd have said, well, at least you can put holes in it. Which maybe would have done, you know. Tony, the interesting thing is that the first line you showed us to the Saints presenter was actually a portal frame. It was actually acting. Oh, yes, 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 yes right. Yes, it so was. But you see, is, yeah. Why did it become when it went to a lattice? Why did it go away from the uh, portrait? In view oh. of the fact that the triletic structure was, was, was portalized, wasn't, wasn't that? <coughs> yeah, but it wasn't quite the same. I didn't show any signs of the triletic because I haven't got any. Ah. Mm. Um, but was but it to do with the difficulty of uh, assembling? No, no. The thing, the, I think, the thing was, Richard, that on the on the, the the original portal frame solution with the curved corners. I mean, you saw all those radial stiffness that we put in. I mean, they were essential. They weren't art. Yes, but that that's was a one-point-two meter deep structure. We're talking about a two-point-four meter deep structure. Yes, that's that's right. Um, but we'd well, there were a number of reasons for that. I think we'd elected by then to make the to, to have this sort of articulation between the, the column tower and, and, and the lattice girder, to have them as separate elements with that separation gap there. And if you do it another way, I mean, you can do it. You can do it. It's quite true as a, as a portal, you know. We could have said, OK, we'll make that, that joint at the corner, the, the portal joint, the moment joint. Um, which means we've got to lock the whole lot up together. Um, and we bring those twin tubes together. <coughs> we make them one. And I think it would have been possible to keep the form that we had of the inner and the outer planes <coughs> going through with no knee joint. Um, but the member sizes would have gone up there at that point, because you've got a lot of forces, stuff going around there, and we would have to have beefed all the members up to do that, which Norman didn't want to do, and I think perhaps rightly so, actually. He wanted to try and, and what we were trying to achieve, in fact, was top and bottom booms, the same diameter throughout, which is illogical in a way. But for, forgetting about the, the sort of visual um, aspects of it, but you can't well, forget about the visual well, aspects, no, well, right? Well, just, just uh, leaving those aside for a, for a moment, do you think that if you had made made those trusses into portals, would, um, you know, using the thinner sections... Well, then we'd have ended up with a knee joint. Yeah, but would, would that have saved steel, do you think? No. It wouldn't have. You wouldn't no, because have, it's acting uh, as a portal, you wouldn't anyway. Have less we've just turned it, the portal sort of thing, the portal idea inside out. I mean, it's not very novel. We've just got that we've got fixed bases and pins up here, rather than pins down here and, and fix fixity up there. That's all. 
That, that two so simple as that. that. Deep structure actually gave you somewhere to put all the junk. Didn't yeah. Yeah. That's right. No, it's a fancy thing. Yes, yeah, that's another thing. Right. 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 Absolutely, all the junk would have had to have gone somewhere that's else. That thing you're yeah, that's right. The minute it's smashing, so we put you know this nice little structure and the tiny, thin skin. Where do you put all the junk? That's because it's designed not to have any junk. That's right. And if it got any, it's either got to go underground or within sort of cabins within the building. You've got to work it out later. Yeah, that's right. Have you worked it out? <laughs> so I, mean, I don't that, think that's, that's my problem. I, I mean, as I remember it anyway, that's why it changed. Yes, that. that's, that's yes, from the yes, the yeah, room. that's true. Actually. Which, have a which, of the which just brings you around to the reflection that both of these buildings are not structures at all. They're tremendously complex structure and services, yes, integration that's, packages. That, that's, that's quite both right. of which still manage to give a great deal of clarity to the structural element despite a tremendous complexity of services. Mm. I think that's, yeah. I think yeah. Sainsbury Centre is the best building built in this country in the 70s, without any shadow of doubt. I think just the internal quality of line is fantastic, whatever the museum people say. Mm. I think it's highly commendable at that level, but it's a tremendous piece of integration between structure and surface. With a few mistakes, there are no buildings anybody does without mistakes. You know, it's just quite fantastic. And this happens when the I suppose architects and engineers come together and are able to think of a building as a complete system, mm. as, a, as a total. Well, in all fairness, our yeah, service engineer was also mm. involved in those discussions with the yeah. services engineers, yeah. but they were there as well, also saying, well, it's sort of a network. Oh, yes. We're sketching in the same way that Tony's sketching and we're sketching. Mm -hmm. and, you know, mm. well, I mean, engineer, I the services engineer are YRM engineers. Mm. I think most people have been fascinated, yeah. and most people are. Flapping a bit and would like something to eat, I think. I should imagine that. I was, How did you get it? Could I, could I just... <laughs> it's gone on saying, I, I was very interested in the, the sort of aesthetic um, discussion, the aesthetic structure discussion, because it obviously it needs um, architects and engineers to be thinking in the same way. Having uh, brought me back to thinking of about ten years ago, we worked with Barnes Wallace. Oh, yes. Who was a marvellous inventor and uh, um, could think of everything uh, and put new ideas on everything else, but he, he took away our drawings one weekend and redesigned them. And he came back and they all had Corinthian columns on them. <laughs> and um, this was a rather sad reflection on the fact that he <coughs> actually moved into a, an element that he didn't understand totally. Uh, and yet, in almost any other field, he was thinking in a very innovatory way. And uh, so uh, perhaps we, we're coming back slowly to the idea of universal man, and that architects getting closer to engineers, but doing it in a I think most way. engineers are going away from engineers. But I don't think we are, but we should No, we're going towards the idea yeah. of... Uh, we, we like may be in this room, a group, group, very large numbers of our group involved. universal man, if you like, that, the, the concept within a group of designers that in the middle is, 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 a, is a, a single idea which relates to this thing of the building of the total system, which is a very complicated thing to know. Mm. But um, it's, it's nice to have to end a discussion where everybody wants to go on talking, and I think we can only thank you for that, because it's been... Well, thanks so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.